Hey everyone, welcome to Q&A with Tori and Alex. Today we're focusing on the topic of mortgage lending with our special guest, Jeff Miltenberger from NFM Lending. Thanks Jeff for being here. Hey, thank you so much for having me on you guys. I'm super excited to be talking with you today. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Jeff and his team at NFM Lending help their clients achieve their goal of home ownership. And Jeff has over 28 years of experience in mortgage lending. So whether you're a first time home buyer or an experienced homeowner, Jeff and his team are super focused on providing their clients with a great home buying experience. So we'll go ahead and get into the first question. Um, uh, kind of let's begin with the ba super basics of lending. Mm -hmm. What is lending? I mean, it, you're, it's kind of like you're buying a car, you need a loan, you need the funds to buy a car and cars are expensive. So you need a loan to make that happen. It's just a bigger scale for mortgages. You know, you know no one had, well, not a lot of people have, you know, $500,000 laying around, you know, in, in the mattress or in the savings account or something like that. So you need to borrow it. And the beauty of real estate is, is you do have the power. You get the power to leverage this asset. That's one of the most amazing assets uh, and you guys can attest to that as well is, you know, a house, it grows in, in value and you can borrow money against it at a very low rate, uh, that just makes it an amazing opportunity to, uh, build wealth. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, another question for you. So I know that there are different types of loans out there. You know, I've heard of jumbo loans, standard loans, et cetera. So what are some of the, uh, different types of loans out there that, um, we should know about? Yeah, great question. There are a ton of different loans out there. And I think it's going to come down to every everybody's a little different. Everybody's situation's different. Everybody's credit's different. Uh, income's different and things like that. I mean, the primary ones that are out there that are conventional loans. Um, they would be more like the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. You might have heard those terms out there. The, those are the government sponsored entities that have the lowest interest rates. Those are typically the better loans. Conventional loans are. Um, but they do have higher qualification restrictions like credit score restrictions that you need to have a little better credit in order to get a good deal on a conventional loan. So in some cases where I'm dealing with a client that has lower credit scores, I might, you know, talk to them about an FHA loan An FHA is the federal housing administration loan. Um, it's primarily for more like first time home buyers, but it's also, uh, very credit friendly. Um, so a client that has lesser credit scores, like say, you know, low 600s or maybe even under 600, they might be better served by an FHA loan. And the advantage with them is typically really low down payment, only three and a half percent down. Um, it's not credit score driven like conventional loans. So again, the lower credit scores qualify for a much better rate. Um, and it's easier to qualify for an FHA loan. So not a terrible loan by any means. If it gets you into this amazing asset that we call real estate or a house, I, I think it doesn't matter. You're, you're, the goal is, is you just want to own a piece of real estate. Um, some other loans out there that you might hear about are USDA. Um, that's literally the United States, you know, Department of Agriculture, and they're more rural loans. So these are going to be loans that are outside the city limits a little further. Uh, the government wants to stimulate growth in those rural areas to keep those smaller communities alive. Uh, so there's some special financing with zero down uh, on USDA loans. So they can be good loans. Um, again, they have income limits and some other innuendos on USDA that may make it not the best option. Um, just for an example, last year we had our best year ever and I didn't close one USDA loan. And it's just because it's not a very competitive loan. Um, another great loan out there for our veterans is the VA loan, an amazing opportunity for our veterans. Um, I mean, I love our veterans. I appreciate what they do. And the government, you know, did at least one thing right by giving the veterans like this huge benefit, which is they can buy a house with as little as zero down, which is an amazing opportunity and no mortgage insurance on that loan, which is even more stunning as far as that goes. So it's not only an amazing deal with a super low rate, uh, but no mortgage insurance or so low payment as well. Um, and then Alex, you mentioned jumbo loans. Um, <laughs> those kind of went away in the pandemic. Um, they're finally coming back and the rates are getting a little more competitive. Um, jumbo loans are basically a loan that's not qualifying for the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac conventional uh, realm. And it's loan limit driven. 
Um, so for example, in a lot of counties, the maximum loan you can get, um, and I'm going to throw out a number because every county is different and it, it could range anywhere from 548,000 up to as high as like 800,000 plus. But in most counties, it's around 776, you know, somewhere around there. Um, so any loan amount that goes over that, if it's above that loan limit, whatever your county limit is, then it becomes a jumbo loan. Now we're looking for uh, uh, an individual investor that's going to invest that not necessarily follows the reg the normal guidelines. Jumbo loans are a little more difficult to qualify for, um, higher restrictions, better credit, uh, usually a substantial amount more down, um, and typically the rates are a little bit higher than the, the normal financing as well. Now, again, I said, now that COVID's kind of painting out a little bit, um, jumbo market is coming back a little strong. And so the rates are starting to kind of fall more in line. Um, but usually meant for higher quality clients, you know, I'll buy in the million dollar house or something like that. So that's the quick overview. <laughs> so yeah. much I can say after that, but I hope that helped right there. Yeah, that was perfect. Um, yeah. And you also mentioned like the 3% down, 0% down. I, and I know it depends on the lo type of loan that you get, but typically um, how much should someone have as a down payment? You know, and I think this is a really important question because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there in the market that talks to you need 20% down to buy a house. And that hasn't been true for like as long as I've been in mortgages, quite frankly, it just hasn't mm -hmm. been true. There's so many different ways to buy a house with very little down. And I believe strongly that less down is better, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like real estate is a asset that you want to leverage, mainly because the low rates, the low payments, and you know, utilize the cash better by investing in other vehicles that could possibly appreciate more, like the stocks and bonds and things like that. So I prefer to try and put as little down. I can't tell you how often I have a client come to me and they've saved up $100,000 and they're like, oh, we finally made it. We're going to buy a house today and put 100000 down. And I'm like looking at their asset base and that's every penny they owe or own. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a terrible mistake in my opinion. Like you need reserves, you need savings, you need to build wealth in other ways. You don't want to put all this money down. And after they leave a conversation with me, they're putting 5% down or 3% down. Or they're paying off a car loan instead of putting all the money down on a mortgage that's going to have this amazing benefit of, of the asset that actually appreciates versus a car that depreciates, um, you know, little things like that. So in my opinion, and you're right, every situation is a little different, but I prefer to go to less down is better. Um, conventional, you can do as little as 3% down. Um, on FHA, it's 3.5% down. You know, and then we talked about USDA and VA being zero down. Jumbo loans are usually about 10% down. They they were 20, but now they just saw 10%. And sometimes you can get even 5% uh, down on a jumbo loan as well. Um, it just depends. Every situation is a little different, but there's a lot of possibilities. Got it. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. So just like any time you're taking a loan, um, you usually need to prove that you're a quality uh, borrower. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of credit score or maybe what range of credit scores um, do you think someone should be in before they look to apply for a mortgage? Dang, you guys are dialed in. I love these questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, credit's another misnomer out there that, you know, you need this super high credit score to qualify. Uh, and yes, better credit does help. Like I said, conventional is very credit score driven early on and FHA is not. And we do want to try and get to conventional if we can. Um, so credit score ranges like the, the best credit score in lending period, typically on, on the normal programs is 740. Like if you're over a 740, you're going to get the lowest rate on a conventional loan. Jumbo loans will price up even a little higher, like 760, 780. You can possibly get lower and lower rates on a jumbo loan. They're the only ones that act that way. Um, but credit's a very interesting thing in mortgages. And, and this is the reason why is you know, a lot of people have access to their credit online, right? Do you guys have access to like, your free credit score, click this button here, right? Yeah. So you look at that credit score and you think, oh, wow, I got great credit. I have a you know 760 credit score. I'm good to go. I'm always telling clients, like, we pull a different algorithm. So when we pull credit scores, the credit score that we pull is a mortgage algorithm, and our scores almost always come in lower than what you see online. 
-hmm. So for anybody that's thinking about buying a house, I think the first step is, is you want to go apply to mortgage lender and get your credit pulled so you know what your mortgage credit score is because that's more key than anything else. And to give you guys a really sharp example of why the difference is, is I had a client that applied, we pulled his credit and he had a six, I want to say it was like a 657 score. He sent me a screenshot of his score the day before from his American Express card and he was showing a 773 or something on his credit score online. Um, he had high debt usage on his credit cards and that's something that the mortgage algorithm doesn't like. Like we want to see how you're using your credit. Do you have actively use of credit, but also minimal use? And that's where the, the combination of maximum, you know, credit score comes. And then there's other people that don't use their credit a lot and have 800 credit scores and they had an 800 credit score on the other algorithm as well. Mm -hmm. So I always tell my clients like, that's great. You have great credit, but let's pull out you. Let's get you applied, get you in. Um, but credit is a very important piece of the project. So even if you're thinking you're going to buy, let's say you're thinking about buying a house six months down the road. To me, today's the start day to start looking into it. Let's pull your credit, see where you're at. If you're at a 740 and you're only going to put 5% down, but you have this potential to get up to like a 760 or a 780, where the help is, is with the mortgage insurance in that scenario. So start today, let's start building your credit up. And then when you're ready to buy four or six months down the road, we repull your credit, your scores are even higher. And now you get a lower payment because you've got better scores that way as well. Got it. And one follow up question to that. Um, is, is there a, a soft inquiry or hard inquiry whenever you kind of run their mortgage, um, their credit score? We do have an access to a soft credit. That's a great. A great question is, uh, yes, we can do a soft pull on that. The only thing is that we can only get one bureau and we use, we use the middle score of three. So we can do a soft pull to kind of see what it looks like, but it doesn't give us the credit information we need necessarily to help them build it higher. And then two, it only gives us one score, which doesn't necessarily help us because if there's three scores and we only pull one, the other two could be lower and then pull everything down. Um, here's the thing. Everyone's scared of an inquiry on their credit. Uh, I say pish posh. I, mean, I, I just don't think that's right. Um, it does affect your credit scores a little bit, but one pull from a mortgage lender out of the blue, like if you haven't had any other inquiries, is not going to kill your credit. It's not going to function in the point where, oh my God, your credit's destroyed by any any stretch of the means. Um, when I'm working on someone's credit, in some cases, I might repull their credit three, four, five times um, and, and try and get their scores up. And every time we pull it, their scores go up a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. So the inquiry is irrelevant in those cases, right. it's more about the quality of what's going on in your credit report. How high is your balance? Like I watch my credit all the time and my scores fluctuate all over the place. And it's completely based on what was the last balance of my last credit card. You know, right. I pay my credit cards off every month in full, but some months are higher than others. You go on vacation and you got a high balance. My credit scores go down. The next mm -hmm. month I pay it off and I got a low balance and my credit scores go up. So it's one of those things that we got to plan together, strategize and figure out what the best options are moving forward. Awesome. And um, so we work with a lot of teachers, a lot of public service employees who have W-2 income, but we also have a lot of clients who are small business owners. And so they have um, contracts with uh, companies that they work for and they get 1099s from them. How hard is it for someone who is self-employed with that kind of contract income to get a decent loan versus somebody who has a W-2 income? So, yeah, I mean, self-employed has been a little more difficult due to COVID. Um, mm -hmm. There's been some extra requirements, uh, mainly because we just want to verify that the business is starting to earn income again. So the new requirement right now, and I, I'm sure it's going to go away hopefully sooner than later because we do not like this requirement at all, um, is they want three months of business bank statements to kind of show that the business has deposits going in that kind of mirror what was going on in their income the year previous and things like that. So that has been a little more difficult for some businesses, but mainly it's businesses that are struggling that haven't returned to it uh, to their pre COVID levels. And it's more of a protection for lending and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that are implementing these 
rules. Now, again, I think these rules will go away um, eventually as we kind of pull out of COVID, hopefully sooner than later. Um, now, in general, just to give you some general overview on self-employed, um, you can get away with as little as one year of self-employed income on the tax returns. It's a little more difficult, but we've actually closed some clients that have only had one year of income. Um, there's some underwriter discretion on that. Um, ideally for self-employed or 1099, you want to have a two year history, two years of tax returns um, to try and show that this average of income is solid, that you're continuing to make the money of this new business. Now, once you exceed five years in business, once you have a five year history in business, um, as long as you have decent credit, you can get away in a lot of programs like conventional, for example, will allow you to get away with one year tax returns. Um, mm -hmm. So there might be advantages to someone that's been building up their business over the years and they have a great year last year, but the year before that was a lot lower An average might hurt them. Whereas a one year might give them a nice, you know, a bigger number that's the advantage of being the five years or older so that you have the advantage of just using one year average instead of two. Um, other than that, there used to be some bank statement programs out there. Again, COVID kind of wiped out those programs. I expect, you know, probably over the next year or two, we're going to start to see bank statement programs. Uh, what that looks like is if we have someone that's self-employed, but they write off a lot of their ass, uh, their income due to expenses, but they show great cash flow through the bank statement, we might collect 12 months of business bank statements or 24 months of business bank statements, do an average coming out of their or going into their account, do an average, and then use those deposits as potential income. Um, those programs typically require a lot more down, 20%, a lot of cases. Um, and they also are rate not rate friendly they're a little higher again this is like a you know it's a unsecuritized program so you got a private lending company that's that's backing the program so they need a bigger return on their money um so the you know the rates might be a little higher uh from that standpoint i mean the key with with business people that we also run into that might be issues and i think this is a really probably the most important point is a lot of self-employed people they write off a lot of their expenses to get their income so they don't pay a lot of tax right like who wouldn't i'm there man i, I try to find every receipt i can to write yeah. off because i don't want to pay taxes uh the dilemma with that is is if you write it off we can't use it either right yeah. so um i mean a perfect point is we get a lot of uber drivers and they come in and they write off all their car expenses gas and everything else and the guy makes you know literally probably makes like sixty seventy thousand dollars a year on on in reality but because there's all these write-offs, the pre, you know, things like that, um, he doesn't. He makes thirty grand a year, so mm -hmm. now he doesn't qualify for a loan because he's writing everything off. So, you know, one thing to prepare if you're self-employed is you kind of have to come to it. You know, one of those decisions that okay, do I want to write everything off and save a little bit in taxes, or do I want to kind of take a little more hit on taxes, not write off every little willy-nilly thing? show more income so that I can qualify for a house. Right. Um, so it's kind of, you got to take a hit one way or another, but it, that's typically what we're working with a lot of self-employed. They'll come to us, they have a right write-offs and they're like, okay, what's the strategy to going forward? Well, you've been in business for five years, you know, filing taxes is coming up in six months. Let's start working on generating the income and then get ready to file your taxes next year and and look at you know potentially not writing off all of the expenses that you have to and, and i'm not saying don't do you know don't commit fraud or anything like that by any means i'm just saying we try to write off everything you know and, and sometimes it, you don't need to let's put it that way right and is that one year would you say um that we would need if we wanted to minimize maybe our write-offs for that year um would that be sufficient enough to qualify for a decent as long as you're in business for the five years, the one year will work. Or if you had a big year the year before and then your next year was lower, you know, it just depends on the situation. But yes, I mean, it's the five year rule. So if you've been in business for five years, then one year usually qualified. You can use just one year. And then, yes, if you just file your taxes and you've got good income on it, we can use that tax return to qualify and we're good to go. If it's someone that's only been doing it for a year and a half or two years or you know even if it's three years or four years you're under that five-year rule so now we're stuck using two years tax returns so it may not be as easy as just having one good year on taxes because again we're going to use a two-year average so that 
that lower year before might drag us down a little bit. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. So quick question just on the process of applying for the loan. So say I'm, you know, somebody that I've gotten my credit score in a good place. I've got some money saved for a down payment. Um, how long do you think the process of applying for the loan and then closing on a house will realistically um, take somebody? And what does that look like? Yeah. And again, I like starting early in the process. So if you're thinking six months out, I'd start today. I mean, and legitimately because of how tight the housing market is right now, it's taking a lot of clients, you know, three, four, five, six months just to get into a house. They'll make offers. They're actively trying to get into a house, but it's just the market is so tight right now that it's tough from that standpoint. And I do think it's a great time to buy. Um, I've been seeing a little more inventory come out um, and, you know, I think interest rates are going to float up a little bit and I think some people are going to jump out of the market, but I just see values continuing to go up. There's so much demand. There's just not enough uh, inventory out there. Um, so someone that's looking to buy, you might want to start a lot earlier than you think your plan is just to get out there and start looking and put you in front. So for example, if someone calls me and hey, I'm in a lease for the next six months, I'm going to tell them to apply today. Hmm. I want to get started. I want to look at their credit. I want to put together a strategic plan to get them in a great position to be ready to buy in six months. Um, you know, there might be a lot of things about maybe the taxes that you brought up or or something else that we can address. And then once you get basically get pre-approved, you'll be like, OK, now I know what I can do. And now you're really dialed in on what's going on. Anything we do in our lives, we should be dialed in and know exactly what we're getting into. And you just don't want to start it at the last minute and then end up with a 660 credit score and now you have to buy right where we could have taken maybe some steps to get those scores up now we're stuck with no options because we have to go more aggressively because of the timing um so i think timeline wise i mean a, a normal mortgage to answer your question alex is about 30 days to close if you get into make an offer on a house you get into contract it takes 30 days to close uh we've been able to close earlier in some cases but that's the normal stage um, if you want to see the process as a timeline, pre-approval is like you apply, takes about maybe a day to three days to get pre-approved, depending on your situation and the documentation needed for the pre-approval. Then you go out and find a house. Again, that timeline would probably take anywhere from a couple of days in some cases, but very rare, to as much six, seven months, a year. Um, and then once you get into contract, you got the 30 days to close out the loan and then you have keys to the house. Cool. Awesome. awesome. And so just kind of closing out here, any other tips, tricks, or things to keep in mind during the whole process? Yeah, I, there's a couple that I would definitely mention. I mean, one is, you know, make sure that you know, the person that you're working with does have experience. I think experience does count in the industry. A lot of people like to go click a button online. And I'm telling you, that's a mistake in my mind. I mean, there's so many innuendos to mortgages. There's so many different fits for each client that if you're not working with an expert in the mortgage industry that knows all those different, you know, facets of the mortgage industry to make sure that you get plugged into the right program and that you put the right amount down for your family to get the right payment and things like that. That is so important. And you just can't get that online. There's just no way you need to talk to somebody that's an expert in the industry. Even if you're a, you know, first time home buyers, it's a no brainer. Like you need to talk to somebody that knows what they're doing so that you can get the advice you need to make the right decisions. Um, you know, someone that's bought a house before and then sold and is going to buy another one, you know, sometimes they know a little more about the process, but I'm telling you, the mortgage business changes faster than you can think. Um, every day we get updates and changes the, and the process changes dramatically. Even five years ago, our process has to change because government laws and things have changed so much. So the process is different. So you still want to walk through the process with an experienced person to make sure that you're making the right decisions. Cause you know, like, like we brought up earlier down payment, like everyone put 20% down. That's the right decision. Not nah, it's, it's rarely the right decision. In my opinion, it's rarely the right decision to put 20% down. Mortgage insurance is super cheap, uh, super cheap. And, uh, with rates being low, again, we want to leverage those assets that grow. And, and uh, the thing I love about owning a house is it's one of the few assets that grows in two ways. One, it appreciates over time, right? The value goes up. And then the mortgage 
as you make your payments, the mortgage goes down. So you're gaining equity in two ways. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to put as little down on this asset as I can, because I know it's just going to grow naturally in two ways. And then I'm going to take the rest of my money and invest it in stocks. I, I, I heartily believe that. And it was a mindset change for me. I was always trying to pay off my house, trying to pay off the house. And about eight years ago, I made a mindset change from a guy that was a, I mean, he's worth millions. And I'm like, what did you do? And he's like, like I just invested everything in stocks. And, and he doesn't own a ton of real estate. I mean, he owns a couple of homes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so what's, how much do you put down? And he's like, I never, I try to maximize the equity. Like I'll put the minimum down in the house. And, you know, I just put all my other money into other assets that grow even faster than the housing market. He said, you got to own a house. You got a right. place to live, right? Right. But be diversified. Nice. Absolutely. Nothing like diversification in your assets and working with an expert like NFM Lending and you. Um, that, that's a good combination, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I love when I go to my clients, we do do a strategic consult. Like my pre-approval consults, here's your loan program. Here's what your payment's going to be. Now let's look at the strategy in this. Like, here's what we're going to do going forward. We talk about down payment. I mean, it's, 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 this is a big decision, right? This is like a hundreds of thousands of dollar decision. The biggest purchase most people are going to make in their lives. You don't want to risk that on the click of a button online. You know, you want to risk that with somebody that's got experience that you can trust that knows what they're doing and has it, you know, and I have a great team behind me as well to create this amazing experience. The homeowners, when I talk to them after it's closing, you know, the comments we get is like, oh my God, I didn't realize it was going to be that easy. You know, that's not the comments you get all the time, right? It can be like, oh my God, we didn't close on time. I lost my earnest money. This happened, that happened, the nightmares. Like I get that all the time where it's like, everyone told me this was going to be a terrible process. So it is super important to work with somebody that's really good at what they do. Absolutely. And Thank you so much, Jeff. We so value your expertise. Um, for our clients, uh, how can they get in touch with you? Well, we'll put our contact information up down here. Well, there it is. Wow, this is just high tech. <laughs> I love this. I love this platform. So yeah, just reach out to me. You can shoot me an email. Um, you can you dial my number right there. That's my cell phone. You can text me on that, and then you can also go to our website as well, uh, just Milton, JeffMiltonBerger.com, which is my name. Uh, and uh, we'd love to start the conversation with you and uh, see what your homeownership goals are as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. No, I'm excited. To, I'm excited to share this information with you and uh, super excited to be working with you guys. So thanks so much for having me on. Same. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your day.